Moriah. This song is, talks about for all he's done, and uh, the Lord's done everything for us. If you're a Christian here, um, then uh, you know uh, every gift, good gift, comes from the Father above, and the Father of lights. And uh, we don't, you know, nothing that we have is of ourselves. We would, if we don't have the strength to do to, to do things, He gives us that strength. So. So we can't uh, brag on our own selves uh, this morning, even though sometimes I, I want to in my flesh. Uh, it's just not right to do that, so I uh, can't do that. All right. says, I need you, Lord, and, uh, you know, he can make it without us, but we can't make it without him, and uh, we need to certainly keep that in our minds, that uh, uh, we need him to be the Lord every day of our life, and uh, we realize that he's in control, and uh, that he knows what's going on, and uh, we need to trust him for those things, all right?
wonderful. Amen. So very thankful to have songs that edify the Lord, encourage you. And I'm so thankful for Brother Dan being able to be here. And, and I always love having Brother Dan come. There's never a warm-up session. Uh, whenever we get together, it's, uh, I guess we've done this for a few years now, but, um, but there's, there's none of that uh, introductory time and then we have to get used to one another. It's like, it's like they've been here the whole year and we just pick up where we left off. And that's one of those great privileges to come in a brother in Christ uh, that has, has a value on the Word of God. And so very thankful for him, thankful for his ministry, thankful that he still puts us on the calendar and comes and, uh, and gets to spend time with us. Amen. So that's wonderful. I appreciate you being here. Looking forward to what the Lord has for us. I thank you, brother. Love you. Man. Hallelujah. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I get to come here. And this is just thrilling. In fact, on the way over, I said to Anne Marie, I said, you know, it's after this COVID thing, you know, it's like, I get to go preach. There's a church that's open. And there's people that are hungry. Amen. And it's so good to see Jonathan and family. And then we have Mr. and Mrs. Parker, too. Right there. God bless you. And it's thrilling to be with you and always enjoy that. And it's good to meet the pastor's wife's brother and his dear wife and family. Appreciate your being here. We love anybody that, we love everybody that loves those that we love. Amen. And we, we are a happy family, right? All because of our great Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're asking the Lord to meet with us in a special way. Are you ready for revival? Amen. And I love those songs they sang, amen. We need, we need the Lord more than we realize it, don't we? And may our hunger increase. That's what really revival is. It's a greater hunger for the things of God than you've been used to hungering. Do you remember the day you got saved? Amen. I will never forget when I got saved. Take your Bibles and go with me to the book of Isaiah. Would you turn to Isaiah chapter 45? That's where we're going to begin. We're going to begin there. I want to, I want you to read this verse with me, okay? Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. This ought to be the message of every Christian to a lost and dying world. Let's read it together. Would you read it with me? Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. That verse was preached on a snowy winter day. When Charles Haddon Spurgeon was on his way to his church, but it was snowing so hard, he thought, I'll just go to the church right over here. And he walked in. The pastor didn't even get there. So a layman got up and he just preached, look unto me and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth. For I am God. And there is none else. Charles Haddon Spurgeon had heard the gospel so many times. And he struggled with how to really be saved. You know, he would do good for a while, he thought, and then He'd feel down on himself. I just can't attain this salvation and I'm not good enough. But when that, not the preacher, but a layman said, look unto me and be ye saved for I am God and there is none else. And it dawned on him, I've been doing all these things to try to be saved and all he told me was just to look. Look to Jesus and be saved. How hard is that? 
It's not what we can do to make ourselves feel that we're saved. It's looking to Jesus who saved us Amen. or who will save us. And there may be someone here this morning. You know all about God. I did as a preacher's kid. I went to church before I knew I was even there. They didn't have nurseries back then. Everybody came in crying, babies. One, one old preacher said one time, somebody please pinch a baby so I'll, so I'll, I'll feel comfortable preaching. Because <laughs> back then, man, all the kids came in and they all got it from the preacher, didn't they? <laughs> they got it good. I want to give you six miracles of the new birth. Six miracles that bring about the new birth and take us through life as a Christian. And I want to use the word, the words, he is able. My God is able. Amen. 2020 was interesting. Very interesting. In fact, I came and preached here in the month of June because I had 12 weeks of meetings canceled and I went home to twiddle my thumbs and preachers contacted me and I stayed busy all of June and July and uh, I thank the Lord for that. But it's amazing what God did in 2020. I, I think it was my greatest year. You know why? Because I learned that he's able He's able not only to save us, you know, people that don't get saved are like people that don't want God to do anything for them. I think the greatest thing that ever happened when God saved me was he took away my sin. I'm still a sinner, but I'm a saved sinner, not a lost sinner. There's a difference. Amen. I know those Baptist people, you know, they think they got everything right. So what I do is when I talk to Baptist people, I say, are you a saved Baptist or are you a lost Baptist? I did that to a Seventh-day Adventist the other day. <laughs> he, he looked at me. He'd never heard that. He said, I am saved. I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I said, amen, because not all Christian scientists are saved. Not all Baptists are saved. You can be a Baptist and split hell wide open. So I think we need to look at this and find out why he is so able and in what ways he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask. And here's, here's God saying, and think. He's, he's got things for you that you don't even, haven't even thought about yet. Things he wants to do. That takes me to the book of Hebrews chapter 7. Would you turn there with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 7? And let's see how our God is able. Look with me there in verse 23 of chapter 7 in the book of Hebrews. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. That's speaking of our great Lord. Wherefore, he is what? He's able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to maketh intercession for them. That is a powerful verse. It reveals that he's able. He's able to save to the uttermost. You've heard the phrase, no doubt. From the uttermost to the guttermost. He's able to save everyone, regardless of who they are or what their background is. Don't think that you can't be saved because he can save to the uttermost. He can save the drug addict. He can save the drunk. 
He can save the prostitute. He can save the preacher. He can save the lawyer. He can save the businessman. He wants to save mankind. And he's able to do it. So the first miracle is that he's able to save. Think about that. By nature, by our own nature, we are condemned. We were born in sin. In sin did my mother conceive me. I mean, I was a good-looking boy when I was little. I had great big eyes. Now they're hidden from many years of labor. <laughs> and uh, we used to get up and sing, us boys, Timmy, Tommy, and Danny. You talk about the grace notes. That's what we were. We called ourselves the grace notes, but we didn't know anything about grace, let me tell you. And we just let it rip. Man, I, and I always, I always sang out of the corner of my mouth, my mother told me. <laughs> Boy, I must have been a sight to behold. <laughs> but we were singing about Jesus and his ability to save us as sinners. Whether we're young or old, we're all a bunch of sinners in need of a Savior. And the great thing is we have a God that liveth. This, this is why we know we can be saved. He liveth forever. How long is that? Quite a while. Eternity with no ending. You know where I want to be when eternity kicks in? I want to be in heaven, Amen. not in hell. And there are people going there. Mm-hmm. Even from church pews. They're going there because they've never given their life and entrusted their life to the one that's able to save them. There was a young man by the name of Tyler. And uh, he was going to church in Pennsylvania, him and his brother and his mom and dad. Faithful family. Been there for years. Kids grew up in church. But Pastor God... That's his name. So every, every two years, I'm with God. <laughs> My son said to me, tell God I was asking for him. He said, man, I haven't talked to God for years. <laughs> but as he would preach the word of God, there were, there were two boys, Tyler and Jay. Tyler wasn't saved, but Jay was. And there was a difference between them. Both nice boys, respectful. Whenever Tyler would leave church, he'd say, take care, pastor. Good to see you. And so the pastor got concerned and said, Tyler? He'd grab him by the arm going out. Tyler, are you saved? He said, nope. And out he'd go. And his dad said something to him. His dad said something to the preacher. Pastor, pray for my son. I don't think he's saved. And so the pastor asked him again. No, no. He told his dad, he said, you've been talking to the preacher about me. Well, he did ask me about you. He said, well, I don't need to be saved. And I'm not getting saved. So he went to work one day. He's a, he was an electrician. He was in the beginning stages. He was working with electrician and learning the trade. And they were using a bucket, those big hydraulic buckets, and somehow something went wrong, and they caught steel onto that transformer, and it lit up that whole unit. Well, the, the senior member of the electrical team there, he, 
he took the electricity like this and was stuck. And so Tyler went over and he hit the thing and delivered him from the electric, the other man from the electric shock that was going through him, but Tyler got it. And the electricity went through him, came out through his neck area, just popped the, the skin and he took a shock and it came right out through his neck. And of course he was rushed to the hospital and guess who went to see him? The preacher. Pastor God said, I walked into that room and Tyler said, Pastor, I want to get saved. <laughs> How about that? Is he able to save unto the uttermost? All that will call upon him? You see, you can know that you're lost and need to be saved, but if you don't ask, you don't get it. He doesn't force his way on you. And we shouldn't try to make people miserable either to try to get them to be saved. They ought to see the joy of the Lord that is our strength and ought to want what we've got, not run from what we have. Oh, he's able. Number two. Number two. Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. In verse 12, the Bible says, For I know whom I have believed. Oh, we've got a Christian now here, don't we? <laughs> Amen. I know whom I have believed. And am what? Persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Wow. Wow. The word of God says, Jesus speaking, and I give unto them eternal life and no, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Where are we this morning? We're in the hand of almighty God. Amen. Hey, we don't hold on to God. Right. Well, I'm just hanging in there. No, you're not. You're failing. But he's holding on to us. When I am weak, he makes me strong. When I can't continue, he leads me on. What a God we serve. I'm in his hand, and the Bible says, no man can pluck me out of the Father's hand. You talk about security. My salvation is the only thing in this world that the devil can't get. How about that? The devil tries to talk people out of getting saved. But once you're in, <laughs> you can't get out. I've never known anybody that really got saved that ever wanted to turn in their salvation. If they did, they didn't understand it. But if you know that you're lost and you reach out and you look to Jesus and you repent of your sin and you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you're in. Amen. He even made a mansion for me in heaven. I live in a little, a little dumpy place compared <laughs> to what he has for us. Amen. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. I'm going to God. I'm trusting him right now, but I'm going to God. I was hoping maybe the rapture would come in 2020. But the Lord said, no, you're not done yet. Get back to work. Amen. Right? Amen. He's able to keep that which I've committed unto him. Now that's good for the Christian life too. Why are you worrying about everything? We shouldn't be worrying about anything. I have to get on myself about that. Either he's able or he's not. 
And if he is, you can trust him and you don't have to worry about anything. The Bible says be careful for nothing. Amen. That means you're not to worry about anything. But he told us right at the same time as he said that, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Now, Lord, I'm not going to worry about this. I'm turning this one over on you. <laughs> God can worry better than we can. He doesn't worry. He knows the end from the beginning. Nothing ever slips upon God that he doesn't know about. That's because he knows all things. He's an omniscient God. He's an omnipresent God. He's in your heart and he's in mine. Simultaneously. He's with all those that have put their trust in him. He's everywhere, man. Amen. And the greatest thing about it all is he came to me. My wife was the first one in her family to ever be saved. And she goes, why is it that God came to me versus my brother or my sisters? I don't know. But I sure am glad God came to her and then told her she needed to go to Bible college. Because <laughs> that's where I met her. Yeah. So God had it for her, and really God put it to her when he gave her me. <laughs> go to Ephesians chapter 3, our third illustration of God being able in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Number 3. Now unto him that is what? Able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. According to the power that worketh in who? You, us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus, world without end. Faith in him changes everything. Faith and trust brings rest to our souls. Faith is casting all of our cares upon him, knowing that he careth for us. We must understand something here. That God is a miracle-working God, and I want to ask you a question. Is God doing any miracles for you? You ought to write them down. I keep a prayer journal, and I write down the things that God does, answers to prayer. I write them down. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. January 1, I wanted to pay my, I, I said, Lord, help me to pay my house off. January 1 to December 31st. I give you one year. Isn't that something how such a peon like me could tell God what he wants? Well, he told me to. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. March 3rd, COVID hit. Lost 12 weeks of meetings just like that. Then I had got uh, COVID, three more weeks of meetings canceled. But oh, I want to tell you, my God is able. So I went to my pastor, uh, I think it was April, we got back home, March, March, April, May, it was May, we got back home. I said, Pastor, I don't think I'm going to be able to pay off my mortgage this, this year because of COVID. And my pastor looked at me and he said, well, you know, there's just some things that God can't do. <laughs> and I took that rebuke real well. <laughs> I got home and I said, Lord, I think you're able. And then I said, we'll see. Have you ever said, I know you're able, but we'll see. That's, that's all that wisdom of doubt that we carry around with us. And now, now, Lord, if you don't come through, I've got another plan. No, 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 no. 
No, there's only one plan. It's his plan. Amen. Forget your plans. Get in on his plan. So, August 5th, I paid the mortgage off. And I said, Lord, why did you do it early? 158 days later, it's done. How come you did that to me? Well, I don't know whether he said this or not, but boy, it sure felt like it. I just wanted you to have a few months where you don't have to pay a mortgage so you can remember who did it. I love my God. He's never disappointed me. I have no gripes with my God. I get irritated with myself, and my wife does too. <laughs> yeah. We have feet of clay. We jump ahead of God. Sometimes we get way behind Him. And so He's saying, Get back here. You're out there on your own. Come on, get close to me. I'm, I don't go in the wrong direction. Or would you hurry up, catch up now? We've got some things we need to get done, but you're, you're lagging behind. Many Christians are sleeping. We, that's why we need revival. Amen. To wake us up to the reality of who we are and who He is and what He alone can do. Right. Amen. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or even think. Mm. Number four, go to the book of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. Hebrews 2, 18. I want you to grab a hold of these verses. Don't forget them. Write them down. The Bible says in that he himself, that's the Lord Jesus, hath suffered being what? Tempted. He is able to help them that are tempted. Oh my. In James chapter 1 verse 1 it says, but every man is tempted. He's tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. It says that the Lord is able to help us in temptation. What that means is when you are tempted to do something you shouldn't do. Because you're saved, the Holy Spirit lives in you. And the Holy Spirit is not silent. He's very vocal. Suppose there's something you want to do that you know is wrong. The Holy Spirit will say, oh, don't do that. Don't do that. And then James tells us, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away. Who's he drawn away from? God. I'm going to do it anyway, Lord. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I've seen couples break up over that. I've seen children go astray because of that. They knew better. They knew what was right. They just wanted to do what they wanted to do and not what God wanted them to do. You know one thing about sin? God lets you hang yourself. You know what that means? He lets you, he, he lets nature take its course to where, oh, you want to do wrong? Okay. You go right ahead. But you're going to pay. You're going to pay. You better be very careful before you do anything that would be against God's will. The Bible says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? How can I walk with God if I'm not walking with God? I can get out there on my own. I can handle this one. I'm on my own now. And guess what? I'm in trouble. What I should do is say, Lord, come here, Lord. <laughs> You're not leaving me. I'm not leaving you. I'm go anywhere I go, you're going. 
Anything I do, you're doing with me. And every, in fact, I'm going to ask you what I should do, and then I'm going to do what you said. That, that's the happy life, folks. Most Christians don't have a happy life. They have a life of endurance. Oh. Oh. I see Christians like that. Some churches I go into, oh. I wonder if they're even saved because they have no visible joy. Where's your joy? Some people are just doing it because that's what I'm supposed to do. You know, COVID worked out great for people that didn't really want to go to church. That was a great excuse to get out of going. Now, when COVID gets over, what, are the, what, what, what excuse are they going to use then? Well, if they get saved, they won't have any reason for an excuse. Amen. Amen. We will come to that place in our lives where we will say, Lord, you have been so good to me. And I get into temptation. It seems like every time I turn around, there's temptation that's plaguing me. But I don't have to submit to it. I've got to say no. Sometimes Christians have a hard time taking a stand among their peers. You young people, you know, everybody wants to please everybody. So you, 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 you get to school or you get around people that aren't saved and you kind of, you know, try to hide God, you know, somehow. So, so you know, you don't look too, you don't stick out like a sore thumb, you know. And then they start tempting you and wanting you to do things that you ought not to do. I said, let me check with my heavenly father and see if he says that's okay. You're what? I have a heavenly father. He lives right here. Inside of me. And I can't do anything unless he says it's okay. You know what you're telling them? They've got the devil in them and they're wanting to do the devil's work. Now you may have to explain that to them. But that's okay, too. You start preaching, they'll, they'll say, ooh, man, I don't want to be around that guy. But isn't that the truth? You're either for me or what? Yeah. You're either on the Lord's side or you're not. You either love Jesus or you don't. You either want his will or you turn him off. He goes, I want to help you with your, I'm able to help you with your temptations. Number five. Go with me to Acts 20, verse 32. Acts 20, verse 32. Oh, I love this one. This is an encourager. Acts 20, 31, 32. And now, brethren, he makes a statement here. He said, I commend you to God. I commend you to God. And to the word of his grace, which is able to what? Build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. That word sanctified means that you are set apart unto God. You've, you've, you've got rid of the world. You've, you've denied your flesh. You've told the devil, no, you can't come and have any territory of my life. You only have three enemies. Thank the Lord there's only three. It's the world. That's the people outside that want to take you down. Right? Notice he said, I'll build you up. So God does the building up. Guess what we do? We go around tear things down. Well, I don't like so-and-so. Well, what makes you think you're any better than them? Well, I am better than them. Your problem's pride, son. Oh, they're bad. They're bad. But you're no better than they are because you've got a critical spirit. Sometimes we think we're all, oh, I'm saved, I'm really good. No, you're not. You're a bad testimony. That's why we need revival. Amen. Amen. Well, I, I live one way at work and I live another way at church. Sounds like a, um, a fence straddle, straddler. I don't know where that word came from, but you want to be on both sides. You can't be on both sides and be truly saved. You'll try it, but it won't work. 
We've got to be all out for God. And he said, I want to build you up. I want to encourage you. I want to strengthen you. I want to help you. I want to build you up, not tear you down. I had a fellow tell me one time, I'm not coming back to church. And I was a pastor. I said, why? He said, I always feel uncomfortable. That was a nice way of saying, I don't like your preaching. You don't like it when I get on sin? Yeah, he said, you're always stepping on my toes. Yeah, he meant it too. I said, I wasn't going for your toes. I was going for your heart. Your problem is you don't have an interest in spiritual things because you feel guilty because you come to holiness. You come to God's house and you feel inadequate and you feel miserable because you know what you're doing is not right. You know, prophets are not always appreciated. Sometimes they're abhorred. Oh, now here comes the preacher. Clean up your mouth. Right? Oh, listen, when we come to that place in our lives where we want to be built up, we don't want to be tearing down. The work of God has enough problems. We don't want to add to it. We want to strengthen the church. We want to help the church to be all that it should be. Anybody can tear something apart. I, I'm kind of the demolition type of guy. I went and stopped by my brother's and he was kind of remodeling an old house and he said, I, I said, is there anything I can do for you while you go and, and, and coach that game? He said, well, he said, I, I would like this bathroom over here gutted. <laughs> you serious? I said, I am dead serious, he said to me. I said, how long will you be gone? <laughs> he said, I'll be gone about three or four hours. I said, it'll be done when you get home. And so I, I, I became a demolition monster. And I had, to, I had to remove all the lath and plaster out of the bathroom. Then I had to remove the wall that goes into an outdoor exit. And we're going to close that door off and we're going to make a bigger bathroom. I said, I'll have it gutted when you come back. He goes, yeah, right. Halfway done. The bathroom's completely destroyed. It's done. There's, all you see is studded walls. Everything's gone. And his wife comes home. And he forgot to let her know. <laughs> I can feel the blood pressure coming up in you ladies right now. She goes, what are you doing, Dan? It's easy to tear something apart, isn't it? Now, we have to bring in real people to put it back together. <laughs> Some Christians are just demolition machines. It just seems like they're always in a crisis, and they always got to tear something apart because their life is messed up. Oh, yeah. But you get that person saved and on fire for God, and they're always building people up. They're always helping people. And I like to get around builder-uppers. Don't you? Amen. Number six. Go with me to the book of Jude and go to verse 24. This verse is so powerful, and I want you to grab a hold of this because this is sometimes the end of people's lives. In Jude 24, now in to him that is able, he's able to keep you from what? Falling. And to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. <laughs> he's the one that can keep us from falling. Now I want to share something with you that it's very important that you hear this, especially you young people. You can grow up in a Christian home, know all about God, see the miracles of God in your life, and, and yet you think in your pea brain that you want to go out there into the world and 
you feel like you've missed out on something. And you fall. You fall. And then you, even while you're doing those things, you're miserable. Because you know that the Holy Spirit lives here and you're doing all the things that he tells you not to do. And some people, they don't come back. But some do. They get back where they should be. Some don't come back because they, they feel so guilty that those people at the church, they're going to judge me wrong and they're not going to take me back in because I disappointed them and they hurt. I hurt my parents and I hurt my grandparents and I hurt the church people and they, they just feel like there's no way I could ever live up to what they want me to live up to. Let's read that verse again. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. I believe there are backsliders out there right now. You may know their names. You must go to them. Give them that verse. You fell into sin. You've done things that have been wrong, but all of us have. Some of us do wrong things and never leave the church. Yeah. We heard our testimony in the church. And then in our pride, we brush it off like, ah, oh, what's wrong with them? Because nobody wants to take personal responsibility. You won't be saved until you take personal responsibility with your lost condition. And once you take responsibility for your lost condition and you get saved, you are a new creature in Jesus Christ. Old things are passed away, the Bible says to the Christian, and all things become new. But over here in this newness of life, the devil's calling. He doesn't want you to be an effective Christian. And so he tempts us. And he puts things in our way to help us stumble. And if we're weak, Christians, we'll fall. But I don't think you can lose your salvation if you're really saved. I told you earlier, right? You're in the Father's hand. No man can pluck you out, right? But it doesn't mean you can't fall. Even the Apostle Paul said he, he, he was afraid that after he'd preached to others, he him, himself would become a castaway. I've known people that have got away from God, but thank God they came back. I prayed for one preacher 10 years. He tapped me on the shoulder one day at a preacher's meeting, and I turned around, and it was him, the one that had fallen lost his wife. She made an ultimatum. It's me or the church. You take your choice. He gave up the church, lost his wife anyway. Unfortunately, and he just got away from the Lord for 10 years. But in a drowning accident, He said, God, if you get me out of these waters, I'll live for you the rest of my life. But he lost 10 years. That's what I'm talking about, falling. Let's read that verse again. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could say, from the time I got saved, I'm not perfect and neither are you. But from the day I got saved until the day the Lord takes me home, I did not fall. May have stumbled a little bit. A just man falleth seven times, but he gets back up again, the Bible says. God knows that we're, we have feet of clay. He knows that we're tempted by the world, the flesh, and the devil. But he's the one, did you hear me? Did you hear what God said? I'm, the, I'm able to keep you from falling. 
You know what I try to do? Fall on Jesus. Amen? Amen. I'm going to lean on you, Lord, and, and I, I may be so weak I can't stand up, but I'm falling on you. I don't ever want to lose that joy of my salvation. I want the abundant life. <laughs> the life where there's fullness of joy, and at thy right hands there are, there's pleasure forevermore. I want that. Do you? Let's pray together, may we? While every head is bowed and every eye closed, Jesus loves you and wants to save you. I don't know whether you've ever been saved or not. Only God knows that. You may be saved, but maybe your Christian life has become boring and unabundant. You've kind of lost your joy like David did. When he sinned with Bathsheba, he lost the joy of his salvation. The altar's open for you that are Christians to come and say, Lord, I don't want to fall. I know I'm going to be tempted, but I don't, want to, I don't want to yield to the temptation. Let's stand together. If you're here and you're not saved, you say, Brother Knickerbocker, I, I know all about God. I'm kind of like you where I... Grew up in church. I've heard the gospel hundreds of times. But I want Jesus to be my Savior today. I'm trading in my lost life for a new life in Jesus Christ. You come. The pastor's right here. Just come right down to the pastor and say, Pastor, I'm gonna, I want to get saved. I know I'm lost and I know I need to be saved. Can I get saved right now? Would you come? As they sing, the altar's open. I want you to find out again how great and able our God is. Don't be afraid to come and trust Him. You'll never regret it. You'll regret if you die and go to hell. You regret you didn't come. As they sing, you come. Please, Lord, save souls. Oh God, I pray that you'd give us a greater hunger for you, Lord. Forgive us where we've failed you. Oh, may we depend upon you in everything. Not my life, but your life through me. You come. Let God have his way. You want victory? You can have it. Pastor.
So very thankful for the message. Amen? Yes. A great way to start off. I was thinking uh, His ability. It goes along with the theme so much. We talked about uh, putting off those things, forgetting those things that are behind. And it's not a matter of not being able to remember. It's a matter of ceasing to hang on to the things of the past so that you can reach forward for the things of Christ. God's the one who gives you the ability to put off the things of the past that often keep us from being able to serve Him in the way that we should. And He's the one that has the ability to give us the strength to reach forward for those great and mighty things that thou knowest not, the things that are so high and so far beyond anything that we could ask or think. It's all in His hand. That's the God that we serve. It's a shame whenever we try to go all about this world in our own power, in our own might, and we forget that a holy and a righteous God seeks to give greater things than we could ever imagine. That's, right. now, that's part of a revival is whenever we stop depending upon ourselves and our own strength and instead we trust Him yes. to, do, to do the things that only He can do by His power and His might. Amen? That's what God desires to do. And I want to encourage you if there was a decision that the Lord was laying upon your heart that maybe you didn't follow through with, you still have this opportunity. Don't leave... Don't ever leave the doors of the church without a decision that He's laid on your heart left undone. Make sure that it's settled. Amen. I hope you'll be back tonight. We'll be uh, starting services again, 6 o'clock. And so make sure that you're here. And we continue on Monday through Wednesday. It's going to be 7 o'clock, just so you know. And bring somebody with you. Amen. Good opportunity to get somebody back in church. Maybe somebody that you hadn't seen for a little while. Give them a call. Say, man, this is the time to get started. Amen. And uh, so it's a great opportunity to be able to do so. Thank you so much, Brother Dan. I'm going to ask you to stand back here in the, the back. Make sure that you stop by and greet him. I want to encourage you, too. There's a couple of tables back there in the back. Brother Dan's got a table full of books. And, um, and go through. Look at those. I know there's some of those that are used. And um, I don't know if he, are you doing a name your own price on that? Or is it a donation? Okay. Yeah. So make sure that you check those out. You want to check them out now. Amen. Uh, before long, you get the pickovers. And uh, so you want to you want to get first first digs, and then make sure you go by Living Proof's table. It's always good to have good music in your home, amen. And you won't find better that honors the Lord. So so very thankful for that. So make sure that you that you're uh, back this evening, and we'll close out in a word of prayer. Brother Ralph, would you dismiss us, please?